Good morning. We are in a sermon series, and this is week three. Today, and one more to go. Now, I know that some of you have been here for the first two, and others of you have made one of those, right? But for a number of you, this is the start. You miss those sermons for whatever reason. Don't feel bad. It's hard to make church every Sunday, I know. You leave town to visit the kids. You go for a quick weekend getaway, a COVID-safe weekend getaway. Or maybe you were gone last Sunday because you were taking your kids, or one of them, back to college, just hoping that it sticks, that the school stays open. Or maybe you were a bit under the weather. Or maybe you simply forgot that it was Sunday. After all, with this COVID semi-shutdown, days can run together, can't they? For whatever reason, not everybody is in worship every week, even when it's online. I know that. I wish that everyone would be, but that's not real life. Now, I mention all that to say that it's possible that a few of you have missed one or both of these, of these sermons in this series. So I want to catch you up. But I, I don't want to bore those of you who are already up to speed. Make sense? Suffice it to say that our series is called What the World Needs Now. We're looking at that famous chapter in the Bible called 1 Corinthians 13. Paul is writing the church in Corinth. It is a talented church, but it's a troubled church. It is filled with potential, potential, but it is also plagued with problems. So Paul writes, and he says, You've excelled in gifts. But what you need even more is to excel in grace. Let me show you the more excellent way. Well, he's got my attention already. I like that. I'm interested. I want to know more. Because excellence is something which I care about. I want that for my life. I want to excel. I want to shine. I want to make a difference. Don't you? Paul says, you want to excel? Then make love the focus of your life. Love. Put it at the center. Make it your highest value. Oh, those bickering, petty-minded young Christians at Corinth, they were enamored with themselves pleased, it seems, with their own accomplishments, proud that they could speak in various tongues. Paul was telling them, look, the acid test of Christianity is not language, but love. In fact, he said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. Now, last Sunday, I told you about this word, love, about how in English we use that word interchangeably in multiple ways, but how in the Greek language, how it was more nuanced and more precise. And so, in Greek, there's not one word for love, But there were four words for love, each with a different meaning. There was the friendship kind of love or affinity. There was a word for the family kind of love between brothers and sisters and parents and children, a a different word. So a friendship word, a family kind of love word. And then there was a word, we know it, Eros, erotic, for 
physical or romantic kind of love. But there was a fourth word, a fourth word, which was the name of the highest form of love. And that word was agape. And that's the word that Paul uses here. Agape love is a self-giving kind of love, a love which is so pure and good that, frankly, it does not come easily to our human nature. Now, these last two Sundays, we've looked at how Paul stressed the supremacy of love. Compared to love, Paul was saying, nothing else matters. Everything else comes in second, period. Good works, yep, second place. What about correct doctrine? Yep, important, second place. Mountain moving faith, oh, impressive, second place. Extravagant generosity, wonderful, second place. Paul says that love is supreme. Indeed, it is the acid test of Christian living, period. Now this morning, I want us to see what the Bible says about agape love. The Bible says, first, that love is a command. A command. God commands that we love one another. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Do you see, friends, love is not optional. In fact, the Bible says that if we don't love others, that we are sinning. The Bible says this in 2 John 1, 6. It says, love means doing what God has commanded. And he has commanded us, what? To love one another. Some of you may think, well, I, I, I can live without love. No, you can't. You can't exist without love. You, you, pardon me. You can exist without love, but you can't live without love. In other words, God is saying that love is that central to life. Now, because it's commanded, that is, love is commanded, the corollary is, we can just know, love is not a feeling. We know this because you can't command a feeling. You can do, you can no more command a feeling than you can command the wind and how it's to blow. Have you ever said to a little kid who is upset and crying and frustrated and acting out, I command you to be happy. I command you to stop crying. Of course not. You can no more command a feeling than you can command a mountain to move. Feelings cannot be commanded. Love is not a feeling. It creates feelings. It produces feelings. Love causes feelings, but agape love is not an emotion. And when we think of love primarily as emotion, as an emotion, we have a shallow understanding of love. It creates feelings. It creates, it produces emotions. But it is not primarily an emotion. We need to understand that. Now, I know we have expressions. People might say, well, I, I, somebody might say, I fell in love as though it's feeling or an emotion. But no, it's deeper than that. God would never command you to do something that he does not give you the power and the ability to do. And you cannot always control an emotion. So, we are commanded to love. Secondly, the Bible says that love is not just a command. It is a choice. 
In other words, God commanded it, but we have got to respond. We choose to love or we choose not to love. It is a choice. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, let love be your highest goal. Let love be your highest goal. I like the way the paraphrase, the message has it. Go after a life of love as if your life depended on it because it does. Did you hear that? It says, go after a life of love. Go after. That means make a choice. Decide. Choose. Love is a choice. It is a volitional act of the will. We must choose to love or not to love. And that destroys the myth we have about love. We so often can think of love as though it's uncontrollable, as if one day I'm walking along and then instantly I fall into love. No control over it. I fell in love. Even that terminology, I fell into love, like you've fallen into some ditch or something and can't get out. No. Love is a choice. Not help. I've fallen in love. I don't know how to get out. Sounds sort of like that old song by Elvis Presley. I'm embarrassed to say I know this. I can't help falling in love with you. That was from Blue Hawaii. Please tell me you don't know that song. Anyway, I don't know how many times that I've had a person, a man or a woman say to me, trying to justify a separation or a divorce, I just don't love him anymore. Or I just don't love her anymore. As if that somehow is totally out of your control. And now, because you don't love him anymore or her anymore, that gives you the right to divorce her. No. This notion that love is a feeling, oh, it's pervasive in our culture. Why don't we just acknowledge love is a choice. I, I know a man who is divorcing his wife, and he tells me, Pastor, I still love her, but I'm just not in love with her anymore. Like somehow that excuses everything. That somehow, and he says, oh, I'll take care of her financial needs. But he's leaving her for another woman, younger. I think what is more accurate would be if he were to say, I'm choosing not to love her anymore. You see, friends, real love does not drop someone that you've made a lifelong commitment to with whom you brought children into this world just because some younger, trendier woman comes along and woos you. A woman who's, who's always fun and makes you feel so special. No. The Bible tells us love is a choice. It's one thing to love someone when the flowers are in bloom and when you're in those honeymoon days. When everything is going your way swimmingly well, when you've got plenty of money and free time and few, few cares or responsibilities. But the real test of love is when things are not going great in your life. When you're out of money. When you're sick and, or you don't feel well. When the pressure is on and you've lost your job. Oh, that's the real test. You, you choose to love in spite of how you feel, and that is the higher level of love. It's called agape. Loving in spite of feelings. Loving in spite of emotions. Love means getting up in the middle of the night to go tend to a sick child. That's love. Love means being patient and kind with your mate even when he or she is grumpy that day. 
Love means visiting an aging parent. When this parent needs love the most, even after this aging parent has begun to lose his or her memory and maybe cannot even say your name. That's real love. Love means being the kind of friend who will answer the call <laughs> and will come help you move. That's real love. Love means embracing someone else's dream and caring for it and being willing to help that person to achieve his or her dream, giving all you can so somebody else's life can be all that it can be. That is agape love. Love is giving a person, it's giving a person what he or she needs, not what he or she deserves. May I say that again? Love is giving a person what he needs, not what he deserves. And that's what God does for us. That's how God loves you. God doesn't give you what you deserve. God doesn't give me what I deserve. And that's why we call it grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. If I got what I deserve from God, I wouldn't be standing here. But God doesn't give us what we deserve. God gives us what we need. That's called grace. Well, love. We said that love is commanded. We said love is a choice. Thirdly, we learn from Scripture that love is conduct. Conduct. That is, it's the way you conduct yourself. It is, it is behavior. It is action. Love is not just some feeling. No, it is rather active. It's something that you do. So the Bible says in 1 John 3, 18, let us stop saying we love people. Let us really love them and show it what? by our actions. Well, can we move beyond this notion of love as being a feeling? Can we understand that it means we get involved? It's more than talk. It's more than sentimental niceties. It's more than some sweet Hallmark card. It's not sentimentality. It is something rather that we do. Love is conduct. And so Paul says to these new Christians at Corinth, make love, agape love, make love the focus of your life. Put it at the center. Make it your what? Your highest value. And then Paul gets specific. He wants to make sure that these Corinthian believers, these young Christians, he wants to make sure that they get it and that we get it and that we understand what love is. Real love, he insists, is not just some lofty idea, not just some noble concept. It is behavior. It is action. It is conduct. And so he writes, lest there be any confusion, any misunderstanding. He says, in essence, let me describe, let me describe how agape love behaves. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. And then Paul, in essence, says, let me show you the flip side. Here is what love is not. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It's interesting. Paul describes love not just by what it is, but also by what it is not. 
Stop acting proud, he says. Stop being rude. Stop your self-seeking ways. Stop wearing your feelings on your sleeves. There was a song way back. I don't know by whom. Stop in the name of love. That's a golden oldie. Stop acting proud. Stop being rude. Stop your self-seeking ways. Stop wearing your feelings on your sleeves. Stop holding grudges. Stop putting yourself first. He says, that's real love. And real love is not always easy. Oh, this kind of love, agape love, it comes from above. And it's the kind of love that God expects from us. Jill Stevenson is an author. Let me tell you about what she wrote in one of her books about her parents and how she saw this kind of agape love in action. Her parents got married when they were 19. And they, when she wrote this, had celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary. <laughs> That's a lot of years together. But today, Jill Stevenson writes, things are not easy for them. Jill says, my mom struggles with Alzheimer's. And something about the evening makes her get even more confused. Medical professionals have a term for this. It's called sundowners. It's a common experience with folks with Alzheimer's. So Jill writes, for mom, when evening comes, she gets disoriented and demands to be taken home. Even though, Jill writes, mom and dad live in an apartment facility for the elderly, a, a, a home for the elderly, so we're never sure what mom means when she starts demanding to be taken home. One night, Jill says, I was watching TV with my mom and dad in their room, and mom started pleading, I'm tired, can somebody get my coat and take me home? At first, her, her, her question was just generally addressed to the room. And then it, it was to her husband, and she gets frustrated. And, and in her full German accent, she focuses in on her husband and says, why won't he take me home? Jill writes in her book, she says, two years earlier, that her dad had his voice box removed and it was difficult for him to speak at all. And he can't comfort or his frightened and sick wife. But my mom, Jill writes, can't remember the surgery and so she just demands, why won't he talk to me? And she shakes her head back and forth. And, and, and this makes her all the angrier and all the more confused. He, I mean, pardon me, he shakes his head back and forth, they, trying to say he can't talk. It makes the mom all the more confused and angrier. He just shakes his head back and forth. He won't talk to me, she shouts. And then she begins to call her husband selfish and uncaring, and she uses hurtful words and names. And Jill says, I watch. My dad's eyes begin misting. He's a tough man. Strong language is not foreign to this old Norwegian painting contractor. But, but thankfully, he understands what his wife is really saying. I'm scared. I'm confused. And that's what breaks his heart. Finally, Jill writes, Mom decides that she could just go ahead and spend the night here, which is her apartment. And then she turns sweet, just as sweet as she had been horrid. You poor man, she tells my dad. Swede, what she called him, Swede, you're a good man. We can stay, we can just stay here for the night, can't we? It'll be fine for this night. And she goes to her home, to her room, and she gets ready for bed. 
coming to my dad one last time before tucking in bed, she puts her hands, one arm, one hand, on each arm of the chair. She gets her face about a foot from him, and with the most endearing look, she asks, do you have anything you want to say to me? I love you. I love you, he mouths. I love you too, she replies. And then she goes to bed. Oh, friends, that's love which lasts a lifetime. A lifetime. A love that is so ingrained that even with the loss of memory and even with the loss of voice and with confusion, oh, it's strong enough to last a lifetime. Real love. Not always easy. But this is what God expects from us. This kind of love. Agape love. A love which comes from above. Do you know what I suspect, friends? That every, every day God is putting around you and me in front of our noses some opportunities for us to grow in love. The problem is so often that we're just too busy and too distracted and we're thinking about our own lives and our own schedules and our own, our own this, that, and the other. And we miss the opportunity to express true agape love. Can we commit ourselves to being more alert and sensitive to these times? How many times have we thought, I, I need to write a letter. I need to make the phone call. I need to check up on so-and-so. I think this person is discouraged. I, I need to give a word of encouragement and hope. I, I need to... Check on my next door neighbor and do such and such. Friends, can we more than ever be focused on the fact that love is behavior? Love is conduct. It's the way we live our lives. Let's not let opportunities pass us by. Let's decide not to let those moments slip by. Let's remember love it's conduct, it's behavior, it is what we do. Does it always come easy? No. It's, it's not natural. It's not natural to human nature because our tendency is to look after ourselves and our needs and our own interests. But the Bible says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes what? For love comes from God. For agape, that's the word used here. For agape, love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. If we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. Oh, friends, if we just pause for a moment, don't we want to focus on what really matters? On the more excellent way, I want warmth and tenderness and kindness and caring to flow from my heart and from my life. I want to grow in love. I want more and more to love people as God has loved me. Don't you? Now I realize that it's not always easy, but I also realize that love finally is the most single, most important thing in all of life, period. It's what matters most. And, we, and it's also what God expects from you and for me. Can we agree to make a commitment to grow in love? It's a command. It's a choice. And 
its conduct. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.